Hey folks, it's Nate, and I'm going to do one more video, review style video, on the Affordable Bender, and this is more or less a follow-up to my initial video on the Affordable Bender. I have a number of folks commenting on it, questioning the build quality of such an inexpensive bender, and some people actually reporting that they've received Affordable Benders that were not built up to their standards. So what I wanted to do, I can't speak to how they're built or how well they're built, all I can show you is what I have here. So in the efforts of complete disclosure to you guys, I'm going to show you every weld, every joint, every anything mechanical on this bender up close and personal in this video. And we're going to talk a little bit about some of the, lim the limitations of the affordable bender, which I did not cover all that well in my first video. So hopefully this will answer any other questions folks have about the affordable bender. If by the end of this video you have other questions about the quality, or what this thing is capable of, please let me know, and I'll do what I can to answer you. So, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Stay tuned. All right, folks, so this is it, the affordable bender. Uh, it's basically a metal frame with a pivot point that these dies fit into. And then there's a big old hydraulic jack. It's an eight ton hydraulic jack that you pump and it pushes the die outward, drawing your tube in this way and out this side, bending it over this, this die as it goes through. Now, there's a couple limitations I wanna talk about before I get into the up close and personal shots I was telling you about. Number one, there are bend radius limitations on this bender that you will not find on some of the higher dollar benders. One of the caveats of the design, okay? The thicker the tube gets, the more leverage this, this, uh, uh, this jack needs, the larger the bend radius has to be in order to achieve that. It's just physics. So this is an inch and three quarter, I think. Yeah, this is an inch and three quarter die for the affordable, affordable bender. This is an inch and a half die. And this is an inch and a quarter die, right? Yes, inch and a quarter. You'll notice the bend radius on the inch and a quarter die is a lot tighter than on the inch and three quarter or the inch and a half die. Inch and a half is the breaking point. At an inch and a half, you go up to a seven inch bend radius. Below an inch and a half, inch and a quarter, you have a five inch bend radius. That's just the way it is. I thought there were options for the seven inch radius also on the smaller end, but I just looked at the website and didn't see them. Maybe they're out there, maybe they're just out of stock, I don't know, but I didn't see them on their website. There's also a limitation on tube wall thickness. In my first video, I bent 120 wall tube on the inch and a half die. One of my viewers so kindly corrected me and said, 120 wall, this thing's actually not rated to bend. You saw it bend it though. So 120 is not a thing you should be bending on this bender. Obviously, it bent it. It was a little tough to bend. I don't seem to have broken anything. It did stretch this uh, clamp a little bit. So bend anything that thick at your own risk. I recommend you check the specifications for the affordable bender on their website before you put any tube through this thing. I neglected to do so. I thought it was rated for 120 wall. It is not. So that brings us to what can you build with the affordable bender? So obviously, anything that requires a bend radius smaller than seven inches, you're gonna to wanna to think twice before trying to do it with the affordable bender. There are tricks and ways to get around that. Uh, you've also got a 90 degree bend that'll come out of the affordable bender. You can get beyond 90 if you're tricky. It's designed to bend 90 degrees. If you do two bends back to back, you can get more than 90 degrees, but the die is designed for one 90 degree bend. You can get 90 degrees by adjusting this jack halfway through your bend. It doesn't go full 90 from zero to 90. Now, maybe I can get this adjusted into that sweet spot where it'll go from zero to 90. Currently, when I take it all the way in, it's a little beyond zero. When I go all the way out, it's at about 80. So can I get another 10 degrees and get a full 90 out of it? I don't know. I have not tinkered with it that much, but the top of this jack is adjustable. So as I was saying, what can you build with this with this bender. Well, can you build a roll cage? Affordable bender says you can. However, 
Most people build roll cages out of 120 wall. That's up to you. You can obviously go with smaller or larger tube diameters to get that strength. So if you did inch and three quarter tube at a less than 120 wall, still a lot of strength there. You can also build in geometry into your cage to help offset the, thick, the thinner wall tube. A lot of people do roll cages with these benders. Are they doing 120 wall and ignoring the spec? I don't know. I'm not at roll cage levels of fabrication yet. When I get there, I'll let you know. Can you build things like tube fenders and rock rails and whatnot with this? Absolutely. I think those are a perfect use for this bender because sure, you can't use 120 wall, which means you're gonna have a slightly thinner wall tube, which means it could bend and dent on the trail a little easier than 120 wall, which is a, again, a very common thing for people to, to build these things out of. But you've got a bender at home, you can build new ones. <laughs> Besides, they're rock rails, they're tube fenders, they're gonna get dent, dented and dinged. The thicker wall tube obviously is heavier. If you're going for lighter weight, I mean, sure, you can start looking at aluminum. Will this bend aluminum? I guess. I don't even know. I think it will. So those are some of the caveats that I can come up with. If you're a hater and you don't like the affordable bender, I'm sorry. <laughs> some people just, they bought a $1,200 bender and they're trying to justify their purchase. Is the affordable bender the right bender for everybody? Probably not. That depends entirely on how much tube you're going to be bending, how often you're going to do it, and what quality you're looking for. You can get a quality bend out of the affordable bender. You can't get a quality 180 degree bend out of the affordable bender. If you need those things, don't buy an affordable bender. Simple as that. For me, getting started with the affordable bender is a perfect starting point. The day I outgrow it, you'll see me buy a better bender. That's all there is to it. I have no loyalty other than the fact that I currently have an affordable bender to the company who makes affordable bender. That does not mean that I am somehow loyal to them. It does not mean that I'm gonna to lie to you and tell you that the affordable bender is better than everything else on the market. It is obviously meant to fill a hobbyist niche, and here we are. I'm a hobbyist. It's perfect for what, I, what I'm doing. I'm learning how to bend tube. It's designed for people like me, maybe people like you, and that's why it's here on this channel. So, with all that out of the way, what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna get you some real close-up shots of things like the edges of the steel and how these joints look what sort of attachment points we have for all these different pieces, like the pivot point of the die and how the jack is attached and whatever. So that way, regardless of my opinion, you can make an informed decision on whether you think the build quality of the affordable bender is top notch or not. So let me get you off that stand and get you a close up look at this bender. All right, folks, I hope you're ready for some extreme close ups here. So we're gonna start at the top and work our way down. This is the upper brace where the top of the eight ton hydraulic jack mounts to the frame. Now, these are the welds. Obviously, these are a very important brace on this design because this is where that eight tons of pressure is forcing against, right? So there they are. Now this, this appears to be powder coated. You can see, maybe it's just an epoxy paint, I'm not sure. Feels like powder coating to me, I could be wrong, but it's this gray powder coat, it seems pretty durable. There's the welds that are holding this uh, attachment that the jack is affixed into. Uh, this can be, of course, loosened, and then you can thread this in or out, I suppose. I have not tried it yet, but that's how you can get a longer extension out of this jack. Bottom of the jack has this bracket that is built. Nice little plate there. It appears to be something like eighth inch steel, but the arms that come down to attach to the to the die, those are pretty darn thick. That's gotta be quarter inch or so. The frame itself appears to be something like quarter inch as well. So this is what the jack attachment looks like. Obviously most of the force is gonna be right on the bottom of the jack where those two quarter inch arms come down. Uh, so the plate on top doesn't matter so much. It's really just there to give you a surface to mount the, the jack, you know, mount to the jack. It's just held in place by this little bolt. Maybe there's two of them, I don't know, let's look. No, one little bolt holds it in place. Again, that's just there for fitment or for a placement, right? Now the frame of the bender is basically this triangular piece, right, with this hole in the center, which is probably just here to, sometimes they say doing things like this adds strength. I don't really know for sure, I'm not a structural engineer, 
But one thing I want to show you is that the frame is two pieces butt welded together. So here's a weld, here's a seam right here, right? Now you might wonder if that's a good idea or not. Obviously the people who designed it think this is fine. Why it's not a single piece, I don't know. Maybe it has to do with the size of the plasma table they cut these things out on. I assume it's a plasma table because it looks like they're plasma cuts. But there you go. Now that is the upper half of the jack. Then there's that seam. And that's where the pressure at the bottom half of the jack would be placed. That's where the pivot point for the die is. Now the pivot point for the die is this very thick shaft which runs through the die and through these reinforcement plates on either side of the affordable bender's frame. And then on the other side of the shaft is basically a washer welded to the end of the shaft. So you can see that there. There's this washer that's welded on here to keep it from coming through. And of course on the other side is a pin. The idea here is when you want to switch dies, you pull this pin out, you pull the shaft out, you pull the die out. Unbolt the die from the bottom of the jack, of course. Pull it out, and then it bolts on. This is that shaft. This is where that shaft goes. And this is where the bottom of the jack mounts to the die. Okay, and then there's, of course, my smaller die. That's the 5-inch ra bend radius die. Same deal. Now, you will notice the tube clamp on this die appears to have a washer welded onto the clamp. I assume that that is because of that same uh, issue, if you want to call it that, that I described to you where this, well, the hole on this thing got deformed a bit. Let me see if I can show you quick. This is how you take off the clamp, by the way, obviously. It's just this grade 8 bolt through here. If you look closely here, get you in focus, you will see that hole has some play in it at this point. And that could be from me bending that 120 wall tube, right? So that did wallow out a bit. When I first, when I put my first piece of tube in this thing, that hole seemed like it was too tight, right? Now, will that continue to elongate? I don't know, but it's something I'm going to keep an eye on as I use this bender. So my only other complaint I have with this bender is these degree marks. They're practically useless because of the way this frame works, right? So you can see them, but I think where it matters is this point here, right? And you can't see it at that point. So what I do when I'm bending is I just stick a degree, a digital, uh, magnetic digital degree finder on the tube so I can tell what degree it's bent at. Remember I said I thought these looked like they were plasma cut. You can see they are a tad bit rough, the edges. Let me get closer here. You can see how that is a little rough. I don't really care, but it is a little rough. So these edges are just a little lumpy, right? You could go over that, finish it, right? Now, I'm not saying that you would as a buyer, but affordable bender could, but it is what it is. That's how it came to me. All right, and then there's the wheel. I forget what this is called, but it's the lead that the tube comes in on, right? So the tube runs in along this, this wheel here and goes into the die, right? Again, there's a shaft through here. Big thick shaft with a washer all welded to the outside of it there. And a pin on this side. This gets changed every time you change the die. The diameter of this matches the diameter of the, the die, right? So whenever you change the die, you change this wheel as well. That's the same for pretty much any bender, as far as I'm aware of. So uh, that is the affordable bender. So folks, that's that. I hope... This has helped you see the build quality of the Affordable Bender. I hope it helps you make a decision as to whether you think the Affordable Bender is right for you or not. I'm not some kind of an affiliate or anything. I can't get you a discount. I don't get any kickbacks if you buy the Affordable Bender. However, the company who makes it was kind enough to work with the channel, so I'm trying to get it as much uh, visibility on the channel as possible so that folks like you can make a decision as to whether you like it and whether you want to spend your money with Affordable Bender. On a personal note, I feel like this is a great starter hobbyist bender. There's a great adage, buy once, cry once, that you could certainly apply to purchasing things like a tube bender. 
It could be that I never need to upgrade my bender. It could be that someday I'm going to be spending $1,200 replacing everything I have with a JD squared or a rogue or something. I don't know. I can't see the future, neither can you. If you imagine that someday you're going to be building race roll cages or starting a fabrication shop or something where you're going to be bending frequently and you need the highest quality possible, the portable bender might not be for you. Maybe it is for you. Uh, I don't want to talk down about the affordable bender, but I can tell you that from what I've heard in the industry and from what I can see by having it in my possession, uh, I could imagine that if you need that level of bender, you should probably look at the higher dollar benders. Things like the Rogue, things like the JD Squared, things like the Pro Tools. Those are all designed to, have, to give you a lot more options than the affordable bender does. However, if you're looking for something to get started with, if you're looking for something where a 7-inch and 5-inch bend radius that isn't interchangeable <laughs> is okay, if you're looking for something to start building tube fenders and rock rails and maybe roll cages with, the affordable bender might be perfect for you, especially if you're a small shop or on a budget. Some folks commented that uh, the only reason I'm giving the affordable bender a good review is because they sent it to me for free, because I didn't spend my money on it, and because I because they, in their opinion, I've somehow been bought. It's not the case. Yes, the fact that I received it free has probably affected my opinion. I can't say that for sure. It's very difficult to be truly objective when you're reviewing a product, especially when a company was kind enough to work with you. A small channel like me, they didn't have to send me a vendor, but they did. They were willing to work with me, and for me, that gained them a few points in my book, simply because they're interested in channels like me and they want to get their products in front of people like you. They weren't afraid to send this to me. No obligations. That should tell you something about the faith they have in the product. So, with all that being said, I hope you've enjoyed this video. I do want to give one quick shout out before the video is over to our first ever patron. Thank you, Tank. I'm not going to use your full name on the channel because I don't know how you feel about that. But, you can expect a swag pack from me in the near future. It's all assembled, I just got to get it shipped out. Um, $15 patrons, they get a swag pack. Just by luck, maybe he planned it, I don't know. But uh, Tank there has joined up with a $15 a month patron to SWB Crawler. I got to admit, I haven't worked out a whole lot more of the benefits because there aren't any other patrons. So, if you want to help me figure out what patrons should get for SWB Crawler, go ahead, become a patron, and we'll figure it out together. So, thank you, Tank, and I hope you enjoy the swag pack. And to everybody else out there, I'm not trying to guilt you into being a patron. I'm just really happy that someone has finally decided that I'm worth the money. <laughs> At any rate, thanks for watching, folks. If you want to support the channel or become a patron, you should head on over to swbcrawler.com. There's merch there, there's a link to our Patreon site, and there's a link to our Discord community if you want to join that so you can chat with me and chat with other viewers. It's not as, happy, or it's not as uh, active as I might want it to be, but it can get there. More people to join. So I hope you guys have enjoyed the video. Remember, get out there and wheel, and I'll catch you in the next one. Yeah.